I built this LED matrix dashboard so I could have a convenient view of important info and alerts. Sure, it can do basic stuff like time and weather, but it can also do more advanced things like showing phone notifications and my Notion to-do list. The rotary encoder built-in also lets me turn on and off the display, easily switch between apps, and even control external services like Spotify. And don't worry, all that flickering you see from the panel is only visible on camera due to the display and recording frame it's not quite being synced up. So let me show you how I built it. The project first started when I bought this. It's a generic LED matrix panel that I got from a vendor on AliExpress. This type of display is made up of individual LED modules that can be turned on and off independently. You can often find these being used in applications like digital signage and billboards. This is because while they can get much brighter than LCD panels, they have pretty poor pixel density. The one I have packs a whopping resolution of 64 by 32, yielding a grand pixel density of 8.5 pixels per inch. In comparison, my phone's display has a pixel density of 390 pixels per inch. And I can't just hook up the panel with HDMI or DisplayPort like I can with a monitor. Instead, we have this Hub75 connector. Not that you know since the pins aren't labeled, and the vendor didn't bother to include documentation in the box. But these panels are pretty popular, so I was able to find the info I needed pretty quickly online. And with that, I could get it hooked up to a Raspberry Pi. To actually display things to the panel though, we need some software to interface with it. I found this display library for the Pi, which came with all the documentation and setup I needed to get it working. It also came with some demo programs to run, and man, does that look good. Though we're still quite far away from displaying phone notifications and all the other fun stuff I want to have. But before we get to the software, let's work on the case first, because this looks like a pile of e-waste. Don't get me wrong, the panel looks nice, but the rest of it, not so much. What I need is just a simple case design to keep it all together and to hide away all these loose cables. That shouldn't take long to design, so let's get to it. So I may have gone a little overboard. Is it over-engineered? Yeah, I could say that. Did I go way over time? Mm, not really. Maybe? Yeah, I definitely did. But you know what? I'm really liking how this case turned out. Even after all this time procrastinating on making this video. I think it was well worth the effort. Now let's take a closer look at this case and go through some of the design decisions and challenges I encountered because man, there were a lot. The first thing you may be wondering is, where's the panel? You know, the thing you're supposed to see? Oh, it's there. It's just hidden away by this front cover. Well, how are you supposed to see anything if it's underneath a layer of plastic? Simple. Just make it really thin. Pretty cool, right? I actually got this idea from a previous project of mine, where I built a 3D printed mechanical keyboard with a hidden lithophane at the top. The reason why most of the light still comes through is because the cover is only 0.2 millimeters thick. But because it's so thin, I ran into a pretty big issue where the heat from the LEDs actually started to warp the front cover which I only noticed because the display would start to look fuzzy after being on for a while. And mind you, this wasn't printed with PLA. This is the PETG we're talking about, which has a significantly higher glass transition temp. To fix this, I first tried to just make the cover thicker, but either it was too thick to let enough light through, or it would just end up warping after a while anyways. In the end, I came up with this design, which has a thicker grid structure behind it that lines up with the spacing of the LED modules, while still keeping the 0.2 millimeter thickness where the light does shine through. On top of making the front panel a lot more rigid, basically eliminating the whole warping problem. The grid also isolates the light from each LED to minimize light bleed. This makes for a much sharper looking image. And I think the result was well worth it compared to the look of the bare panel. The next thing you may be wondering is why does the case look so complicated? I thought you said all you needed was a simple case design. Now I'll admit, the design is pretty intense with all these parts and pieces, and that's only the ones you can see from the outside. But this design actually has quite a few things going for it. For starters, it makes it a lot easier to use the rotary encoder. In fact, you can use it one-handed, something that was a lot harder to do with previous designs I considered. But the main reason why I went with this design was so I could do this. It swivels. Like what you see on a smartphone, apps could be designed to have different horizontal and vertical views. 
apps could also use the sova like a button for additional user control. With the help of a tilt switch inside the top case, I can automatically detect and switch orientations in software. To make this work, I had to tackle a lot of problems like creating internal wire channels because the rotor encoder and power connector are in the base, but the pie that they need to connect to is located in the top case. And if that wasn't hard enough, it also needs to be routed in such a way to prevent the wires from getting damaged when the top case rotates. Another issue was that the case could tip over pretty easily in the vertical position, since there's nothing locking it in place. To fix this, I added a few magnets to each side of the swivel mechanism, strong enough to resist any accidental nudges, but still easy enough to rotate the dashboard by hand. On top of solving the design challenges, I also had to make a few hardware modifications to make this design work. To make all the electronics fit inside the top case as thin as I could, I had a muta. I mean, gently remove the USB and Ethernet ports from the Pi because they protruded too far out from the board. I also created a low-profile adapter to connect the LED panels to the Pi, replacing the rat nest of jumper wires from before. It looks super jank because, well, it is. It was meant to just be a quick prototype before investing the time to make a better one. But then I got too lazy, so I just stuck with it. Now that the hardware and case is done, all that's left is the software. Here it is, the completed dashboard. But before I show off its features, let's run through some of the work I did underneath the hood. The code was written in Python and uses the library I mentioned earlier to draw stuff onto the panel. At the high level, there's three main components to the software, the controller, apps, and modules. The controller does a lot of the heavy lifting that the user never actually gets to see. It's responsible for the app and module management, as well as handling user input. It also acts as the bridge between the display library and apps, as all the frame data must be sent through it. Apps are what the user actually gets to see and interact with. The controller tells the apps if and how the rotor encoder was used, as well as the orientation. In response, the app must generate a frame to give back to the controller, which will eventually be displayed on the panel. In the process of deciding what gets displayed, apps also have access to modules for more specialized information and functionality. You can think of modules kind of like shared helper functions for the apps, because they all share the same instance of each module. Each module is written to do a specific task, like fetch weather data. Just because multiple apps need the weather doesn't mean we need more than one API call to the weather service. For those who want more details, I have a link to the repo down below with the code base and CAD files. Now, let's see the dashboard in action. When you first boot up the dashboard, you're greeted with the main screen app. Like the name implies, this app was designed to be shown most of the time and shows a little bit of everything all in one place. The most important part of this app is displaying phone notifications. As someone who constantly leaves their phone on mute, I miss notifications from time to time. So the hope is that with the dashboard on my desk a glance away, I will miss fewer notifications as they come in. And after the couple of weeks I've been using it so far, I can say it's been working pretty well. I'm using a service called Pushbullet to mirror my phone notifications, and even though it provides the contents of the notification, I went for a more minimalist approach because I mainly just want to know when I do get a notification, so I can pull out the phone to read it and address it. Each app is represented by a corresponding notification color, and they pop up whenever I have at least one unread and all of it is neatly tied into this great background drawn by Milk and Espresso. She's a great artist and streamer, so go check her stuff out. But what if you wanted to change a pace? Maybe a different background, a different layout, or you actually want to see the contents of the notification? Well, it can do just that since the main screen app supports multiple themes. If you long press on the rotary encoder, we toggle into select mode, where it can now cycle through all the other themes instead of cycling between apps. This cloud theme handles notifications completely differently by actually scrolling the content across the screen. It also does a flashing animation when the notification first comes in to try to catch your attention. After getting out of select mode, we can now use the encoder to switch to the next app, my Notion to-do list. Having my to-do list on the dashboard makes it easier to check my upcoming tasks without it taking up monitor real estate. It's not a big issue, but it's definitely nice to have, especially when I don't have my computer on. But onto the app itself, it displays the top five tasks sorted by due date, and the bar on the side matches the task status. Tasks labeled to do and ongoing stay on the screen, while completed ones get filtered out. This means that the app is specifically built for the format of my to-do list, but honestly, it shouldn't be too much work to adapt it to another. The next few apps are pretty straightforward, so let's quickly run through them. First, we have the weather app, which displays a lot more of the weather info provided by OpenWeatherMap than just the current temperature on the main screen app. 
I ended up creating these icons myself based on the set used by Open Weather Map to fit the low resolution of the panel. Next, oh, what do we have here? A YouTube sub counter. That can't be right. It says I have zero subs right now. How about you hit the subscribe button below and help me figure out if it's working or not. Don't worry, I'll wait. Moving on, we have some eye candy. The GIF viewer displays any 64 by 32 GIF. Pretty straightforward. Like with the main screen, we can long press into select mode to cycle through all the other GIFs stored on the dashboard. We also have an implementation of Conway's Game of Life. There's a version of it as a demo from the library, but I wrote my own to play nicely with the rest of the code, and it comes with the added functionality of a reset button and preset oscillator patterns. Last, but certainly not least, we have the Spotify app. The dashboard doesn't play music itself, because there's no speaker built into it. Instead, it provides playback controls to a device Spotify is currently running on. We enter player mode with a long press, as indicated by the green play button, and gives us pretty standard controls. Single press for play pause, double press to skip forward, and triple to go back, and turning the knob will raise or lower the volume. On the left side, we have the album art, which I fetch and scale down to 32 by 32 to fit on the screen, and some of them look actually pretty decent. I also grabbed the time elapsed from the API, along with the song duration to make a simple progress bar. A nice side effect of using the Spotify API is that I can control any device actively playing, provided it's connected to my account, whether it be my phone, tablet, or computer. And now we cycle back to the main screen. But wait, there's more. We still haven't seen any of the rotation feature I spent so long designing the case to support. As I said before, the software detects the orientation based off of readings from the tilt switch. But what happens in response is completely up to the individual app. This includes simple things like different layouts or entirely different functionality. For example, from the main screen, if we rotate the display up, we get this. Did I make this entirely for the meme? Perhaps. Did I spend way too long getting this video out? That's not really relevant anymore. Maybe? Will I ever use this again? Probably not. I'll probably swap it out with something more useful since it's easy to access from the main screen. If you have a good idea for it, please let me know down in the comments below. And that's about it for the dashboard. While there's still so much more I could do with it, like creating more apps or improving the UI, I'm pretty happy with where it's at right now. It's about time to move on to another project. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give a like and subscribe if you want to see more. Thanks for watching.